Yo, what's good, New York? You're listening to Revolutions Per Minute on WBAI listener-funded radio. Uh, Revolutions Per Minute is a socialist radio show and podcast from members of the New York City Democratic Socialists of America. Today, we're discussing the continuing struggle for immigrant justice as the forces of reaction continue to demonize and terrorize our most vulnerable neighbors in the city. Throughout uh, this episode, we'll be speaking with Pam, an organizer from the Immigrant Justice Working Group, about organizing against the deportation apparatus and for the empowerment of immigrant communities. We'll also be hearing an interview with Elijah, another organizer with New York City DSA's Immigrant Justice Working Group, on canvassing for the Protect Our Courts Act alongside the Tiffany Caban campaign. But first, the headlines brought to you by The Thorn. In response to the popularity of rent laws that protect tenants and keep people in their homes, a coalition of landlord groups, including the Real Estate Board of New York, has launched a major ad blitz to try to convince New Yorkers that despite our lived experience, the rent is not high enough and we do not need more rent protections in this state. Keep your eye out for those ads on Facebook and the subway. Last Thursday, over 100 New Yorkers lined up to testify about rent laws in a state assembly hearing in Manhattan. The fight to expand New York State's rent regulation continues to heat up ahead of their June 15th expiration, with a major rally planned for May 14th. Momentum is slowing to pass the New York Health Act, however. Several state legislators who campaigned in support of the bill are walking back from their former backing of the legislation, likely cowering to pressure from Cuomo and the insurance industry. Some unions, including UFT, have been acting at the behest of industry coalitions to try and kill single-payer in New York State. Lyft and Juno's attempt to block the city's mandatory driver minimum wage rule failed in state court. The app-based rideshare drivers are planning to strike and hold a rally at Uber's Long Island City offices tomorrow, May 8th, ahead of the company's multi-billion dollar IPO, which they say they are seeing none of the benefits of. Drivers are calling on riders to boycott the rideshare apps on May 8th as well. Mayor de Blasio's $92 billion executive budget proposal includes $629 million in cuts. Thrive NYC, his wife's mental health initiative, is among the losers with a $9 million loss. The proposed budget contains only $22 million for the 2020 census, despite experts asking for $60 million to ensure the appropriate counting of all New Yorkers. Three years after an NYPD raid swept up 120 people accused of participating in street gangs, a new report by CUNY professor Bay Powell and CUNY grad student Priscilla Bustamante exposes the abuses behind the prosecutions of these mostly black and Latino young men. Legislation has been introduced in the state Senate and Assembly that would ban new natural gas plants and pipelines and have state officials create a plan for moving the state's electrical grid off of all fossil fuels by 2040. This is the kind of action we need to prevent climate change. Vocal New York is planning a major voter registration drive in Queensbridge and Ravenswood NYCHA houses ahead of the June 25th Queens DA Democratic primary. Vocal's political action committee has endorsed Tiffany Caban in that race, and she has also recently scored an endorsement from council member Brad Lander, who represents Park Slope. The Right to Counsel Coalition, Just Fix NYC, and the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project have released a list of the worst evictors who continue to sue, harass, and evict tenants in the Right to Counsel zones within the city. You can check out their work at worstevictorsnyc.org. This is Annalisa with Revolutions Per Minute headlines from The Thorn. Thank you, Annalisa, for an amazing job reading the headlines and all the work you do here at RPM. Uh, Our daily headlines are brought to you by The Thorn, an incredible weekly newsletter by NYC DSA's Electoral Working Group, covering local politics and radical activism. You can subscribe at thethorn.nyc. So today, uh, just to reintroduce myself, I'm Jack, he, him pronouns, and I'm here with Pam to discuss immigrant justice and the Protect Our Courts Act. Hey, Pam, how's it going? Uh, uh, Do you want to introduce yourself and just uh, let us know why you got involved in the struggle to build socialism? Sure. Uh, I'm Pam. I'm uh, with DSA's Immigrant Justice Working Group, as Jack said. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And I got involved with immigrant justice and with DSA uh, because I really wanted to be part of helping build a more just and equitable society, Um, a society where everyone has access to health care, education, housing, freedom from violence, but also where people have a ability to thrive and to have leisure time and to... um, 
be able to, to be with their families and live their full lives. Yeah, a society where people are actually free instead of worshiping freedom while they have to sell themselves to their boss for eight hours or more every day. And something that is, I think, really critical aspect of freedom is the freedom of movement to be able to uh, stay where you are, but go to other places. So what uh, motivated you to get involved in the work that immigrant justice is uh, doing and organizing within DSA? I've been um, involved with immigrant rights work in the past uh, with worker centers in El Paso, Texas, and, and here in New York many years ago. And um, I was, like so many people, incredibly angry and upset uh, after Trump was elected and seeing the way that he was criminalizing and demonizing immigrants. Um, I know that there were large numbers, of course, of detentions and deportations under Obama, but it seemed that things were really intensifying under Trump um, and that there was this tremendous move to um, really dehumanize immigrants um, and, and, of course, to, to increase um, so many of the policies that have been so detrimental to immigrants and their families. So... I felt compelled to, to get involved uh, more than I had been in recent years. Um, I knew a lot of folks who were in DSA, some of whom were seasoned activists who I had known for years, and some of whom were younger um, activists who I hadn't known, and I was impressed uh, with those folks and with the work that they were doing and the energy that they had, and um, so I decided to get involved. Yeah, I think you bring up a very critical point in that um, immigrants have been abused, uh, I mean, for for centuries, but uh, even under the Obama administration, the numbers of deportations were horrific. But Trump's just vile and disgusting rhetoric and his openly brazen and like violent policies towards immigrants, I really think has like wakened people up um, to realize the importance of fighting for immigrant rights and the need to not uh, castrate uh, immigrants as some separate population, but as human beings who are uh, just one of us. Um, so, like, why is fighting for immigrant rights so critical for socialists? Well, one of the things I think that we saw um, in the face of these really increasingly punitive uh, and inhumane immigrant immigration policies was also a lot of organizing and a lot of organizing in immigrant communities. One of the things that I think is really important to remember is that even though um, a lot of immigrants are in very difficult circumstances, they also bring a tremendous history of organizing to this country. And they bring a lot of experience from their home countries. That's certainly been true uh, among immigrant labor activists. Um, I think we saw just tremendous courage uh, among young people, DACA recipients who have been coming, you know, for a number of years now, who've been coming out of the shadows and speaking up. Um, we are not afraid. We will not be silent anymore. Um, and that was inspiring. And I think the fight for immigrant rights is really a, a fundamental part of building the kind of socialist society that we want to see. Um, it's very closely linked with labor struggles, workers' struggles for workers' rights. It's it's very closely linked with anti-racist struggles and, and the fight against mass incarceration and prisons for profits, detention center for profits. It's the same companies that are investing in detention centers um, as in prisons um, and, and making tremendous profits about, over that. And the, the increase in rhetoric that we've seen um, against people of color um, is also, of course, has been um, you know, anti-immigrant rhetoric as well. And so I think those struggles are, are very much tied together, and the fight for immigrant rights has to be a, a, a fundamental part of the struggle for a more just society. Yeah, if, if we're not standing up for immigrants and if we're not recognizing the common humanity between all of us and that um, that we are all workers and that we, you know, while immigrants face particular difficulties, and I, I don't think we should, like, um, wash over the differences, we need to acknowledge them and, like, fight against the construction of these differences that exist in our society because of policies of the state um, and laws that, um, like, the ruling class, that capitalists, that high-level government officials use to def divide us against each other so that um, we can't fight for our common goal, which is, you know, actually empowering all the workers in society. Um, and not just like workers in a traditional sense, but all people who live 
off of their own labor, which uh, doesn't just mean like going to a nine to five job. It includes uh, domestic workers who are disproportionately immigrants who are doing so much of the critical work that our society um, would not survive without. So it's absolutely necessary for us to be um, fighting for immigrants' rights um, so that we can build uh, movement together and build power together um, against like the really vile forces that want to um, disempower everyone but the most powerful people in society. Yeah, and I think while we have seen um, a real increase in, in the punitive policies by the administration and just a tremendous the creation of a tremendous uh, culture of fear for immigrant families. We've also seen a lot of people coming forward and, and organizing, and I think it's important to acknowledge the organizing that's happening in immigrant communities across the country um, and to acknowledge that um, how hard, you know, how difficult that is for people and that that's happening. And at the same time, it really creates a responsibility for those of us um, who don't have that fear, who have our, you know, security and our immigration status and in our citizenship to, to be a part of that struggle and to stand in solidarity with folks. It's deeply inspiring that even under such harsh conditions where you could be, you know, thrown out of the country, you could lose contact with your family, you could be violently attacked. Even if you're not an undocumented immigrant, you're also, because of the racism in our society, um, many migrants also just face the threat of attack of, like, v uh, vigilantes we just saw on the border, uh, like, uh, what this like a couple weeks ago there was a group that like gathered up a bunch of migrants and like threatened to to murder them and we've seen it there's been attacks um on the streets uh throughout the trump administration against um people who either were immigrants or they uh were maybe descendant um from people who were originally from central american or south american countries so it's it's a way if we're enabling the like the forces of reaction to to tear us apart. Uh, we lose, and we should be inspired by the real incredible organizing and learn from um, these migrants who are really building power in their communities and and standing up and showing that you know when they're united they won't be defeated, and when we're all united, like the ruling class can't take us down. Yeah, and I think people have shown tremendous courage in making the journey to. Um, to come here fleeing tremendous violence and um, you know a lot of I think one of the things that has been really motivated a lot of people to action has been seeing the really inhumane conditions on the border has been seeing people in you know kids families um, being locked up held in detention the the images that were coming out from El Paso some weeks ago of people being held essentially in cages um, you know and and people are coming despite tremendous odds uh, despite the the tremendous risk and um, you know and I think that that seeing those images and seeing the really inhumane conditions uh, that people are being held in and the fact that people have a, a right to come and, and to request asylum and then that fundamental right is, is being denied um, in so many different ways right now by the metering at the border, by the um, keeping people from being able to present themselves for asylum, um, being kept in the, in the detention facilities there. Um, and, you know, that has also both, I think, created a lot of justified outrage on the part of people um, and also the, the move to action. Yeah, and I want to uh, jump back to that point, especially, the, you know, the, the horror on the border, but also the sources of U.S. Um, both like state and capitalist violence in Central America and Mexico that un, like forced people out of their homes in the first place. But first, I just want to remind our listeners that you are listening to Revolutions Per Minute on listener-sponsored WBAI in New York City, broadcasting at 99.5 FM and streaming on your favorite podcast app. To connect with us after the show, you can email us at revolutionsnyc at gmail or sign up for our newsletter to get links to what we talk about on the show. You can do that on our website, revolutionsperminute.simplecast.com, and you can also find us on Twitter at NYCRPM. 
Uh, today, we're also in the midst of a funding uh, drive for WBAI. And if you want to hear more content like this, where we are talking to organizers who are working on the ground, who are you know really fighting against uh, the forces of capital and reaction that are uh, attempting to like violently uh, destroy um, the type of society that I believe people listening to the show believe in. And that if you want to hear more from these fighters, um, then it's really critical for you to donate to this um, radio station, which doesn't take any corporate money, doesn't take any grant money. We're funded by our listeners. It's a, it's really actually kind of like a, a democratically run and managed operation. Um, if you be become a WBI buddy, you can, and if you donate uh, $10, then you can actually have like voting rights within uh, WBAI. You can become part of the process. Um, so if you want to pledge any money, in, any money to WBAI, whether that's in our name for the show, and I know we got some great socialists out there listening that love this content and want more of it, you can call in at 516 620 3602. That's 516 620 3602. Or you can go to give to WBAI.org. That is give to WBAI.org. Or on your smartphone, you can text WBAI to 41444. That's 41444. And just text WBAI. It would be really amazing um, for you to contribute. Um, if you want to hear more radical content, people who are really kind of dealing with the issues of the day in a critical way, but not just talking about them. We're talking to people who are on the ground fighting to build a better world. And we won't have that fight if we don't have the type of media that we have here at WBAI. We need a people's radio, and this is the best thing that we have right now. So continue to fight for WBAI and donate if you uh, have the chance. Uh, so, all right, we just want to jump back uh, to our conversation on uh, immigrant justice. And we were just discussing um, how there's this real horror on the border. You have these concentration camps. At the same time, you have both Trump, the Republicans, the right-wing media kind of de constantly demonizing and otherizing um, migrants and acting like they're this invasion, that they're this foreign whore that's coming to take away Americans' uh, well-earned wealth, that they are undermining our society. But this is an utterly ridiculous framing that completely erases history. Um, if anyone actually knows anything about what this country has done in Central America and to Mexico um, throughout its history, but particularly in the past 40 years, that sort of framing, I mean, it, it, it's obviously morally outrageous, but it's just historically false. Um, I don't know if you have anything uh, you'd want to add to that, uh, but I just I feel like bringing up the dirty wars and NAFTA is and what they did to Central America and Mexico is really critical to understanding this conversation. Yeah, I um, actually lived in El Paso right before NAFTA was passed, and I worked with women who were working uh, on the U.S. side of the border in uh, garment factories there who were organizing. And it was just um, clear that things were going to radically change. Um, and there were, of course, the maquiladores were already there. So many people were coming to work in those factories on the Mexico side of the border for very low wages. And you could already see the ways that things were beginning to change, the way that people were coming from the countryside to work in the maquiladoras, um, but not really able to support themselves there, the way that uh, so many families were losing the land that they had because of the changes in trade policies, the way that the economy was shifting, and the tremendous impact that that, that, that trade policy that trade agreement was having. And I think we've seen that with uh, throughout Central America. We've seen that uh, throughout Mexico. And we've seen just the way that U.S. policy has really impacted those countries um, economically and, and politically as well, and how so many people now, more recently, of course, are fleeing tremendous violence. And that is not 
uh, divorced from the role that the U.S. has played in um, intervening in, in Central America, in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, in Guatemala, in Honduras, um, and, and having an impact on squelching movements in those countries for um, a more a more humane and, and just society, the revolutions that took place there. So that's a much longer conversation, but I think that it is really a result of those policies, um, in part, that there has been such a, an increased influx of immigrants. And so we're not, um, you know, this country has a, a responsibility um, that is not really talked about in this conversation, um, but it's a, a really critical part of that conversation. Yeah, it's the... Uh these migrants are fleeing uh, circumstances that have been created by the United States backing death squads that were trained and armed by the United States that murdered tens of thousands of peasants who are just fighting for rights to their land that they were they were murdering countless uh, just indigenous communities who just wanted to live life as it, they always had. And they were f also fighting against, you know, revolutionaries who were fighting for a more democratic, more just socialist society. And the this violence um, is did not just vanish um, once these wars, quote unquote, ended. Many of uh, the people in the hot that are in like the highest levels of the cartels that dominate those areas um, and in those governments as currently constituted were part of the death squads funded and armed and trained by the United States. And we can never forget that when we're talking about the immigration crisis. The crisis has nothing to do with the, the people who have been forced out of their homes. It has everything to do with the United States forcing those people out of their homes by backing the most violent and reactionary forces in that those societies. Um, so we're going to jump from this uh, broader historical uh, discussion into the current context of uh, Trump's specific attacks um, on the immigrant population here in New York. Uh, ICE, as we discussed before, was already committing heinous acts and deporting millions of people prior to the Trump administration. But things really accelerated once Trump um, came into office. Um, what is uh, specifically uh, different about uh, Trump using ICE in courts? And uh, how? what has been the um, strategy of the DSA Immigration, Working, uh, Immigration Justice Working Group to fight against that? Well, I think one of the, the biggest changes that we've seen um, in the last uh, few years has been the presence, the increased presence of ICE in courthouses um, and the number of ICE arrests that have happened in courthouses. So throughout the state of New York, for instance, um, since 2016, there's been a 1,700 percent increase in courthouse arrests. And that was that's really been documented by the Immigrant Defense Project, who's done tremendous work on documenting the presence of ICE in the courthouse and and the need, you know, the impact that that has um, and the, the need to fight against it. So um, we've seen um, just a much more blatant activity by ICE in the courts. Um, and as a result of that, the Immigrant Justice Project of, of DSA started organizing for ICE out of the courts in 2017. Um, and we were canvassing for signatures on a petition to the chief judge, Janet DeFiori, um, to call on her to require that ICE have a judicial warrant um, in order to, to actually make any arrests in the court, which was not necessary previously. So we did a lot of education on that. We did a lot of collecting of, of petition signatures. We collected about 4,000, which we delivered to DeFiori's office, um, the Office of Court Administration, in October of last year. Um, and they were not happy to see us. Uh, <laughs> they um, reacted quite aggressively, actually. Um, one of our activists um, was, was filming the the action on his cell phone and the Office of Court Administration officer essentially assaulted him, grabbed the cell phone uh, from him, grabbed him, demanded that he erase the video uh, from his cell phone, and then kicked us out. Um, but we did manage to deliver those petitions, um, and we were at that time connecting up with a lot of other organizations in the city who were also protesting ISIS presence in the court. And I think that one of the reasons 
that is really important is because the fact that ICE was in the courthouses arresting people in and around the courthouses meant that immigrants undocumented and, and, and folks who had documents also were just increasingly nervous um, and turned away from appearing in court, uh, whether it was for their own hearings or whether if they were um, witnesses or victims of domestic violence or in housing cases, all kinds of cases. It was a real uh, deterrent to people appearing in court. And that was a violation of those people's rights, but also really creates a much less safe environment for everyone. Um, so we did a lot of work with legal aid attorneys who were very active um, in Bronx and Queens and Brooklyn um, in Manhattan in fighting ISIS presence in the courts. There were a number of walkouts by legal aid attorneys about ISIS presence. Um, and we worked with groups like Bronx Defenders, the New Sanctuary Coalition, and LASE the Immigrant Defense Project, um, to, to protest ISIS presence in the courts. Um, we did a number of uh, rallies and demonstrations. And in um, the response by the Office of Court Administration when we delivered those petitions and for many months around that time of, of last year and early this year was essentially we are not going to kick any law enforcement agency out of the courts, um, and that's not going to happen. But in April of this year, they um, issued an order essentially saying that in order for ICE to make any arrests or in the courthouse, they had to have a judicial warrant. Um, signed by by a judge and so that was a huge victory um, it came right on the heels of a, a major report by the immigrant defense project about the impact of ISIS presence in the court and it came after many months of organizing on the part of a lot of activist groups uh, including DSA's immigrant justice group and so I think one of the things that that showed is really that organizing works um, and that has been really important. Yeah, that I mean, uh, it's a really amazing story, and I it, I think you're absolutely right. It demonstrates the power of people organizing on the ground, building grassroots organizations that um, can last even beyond what might have be, felt like an initial setback. You saw you delivered the petitions, but uh, there wasn't an immediate response. But the work continued people got out and they demonstrated and it really sh shifted things. Obviously, there's still a lot of work um, to be done, but it's a really, really impressive um, campaign. And I think it shows how uh, groups like um, NYC, DSA, Immigrant Justice are building power um, in this sphere and that it's a fight that we need to continue to have. So uh, you are listening to Revolutions Per Minute on listener-sponsored WBAI in New York City, broadcasting at 99.5 FM and streaming on your favorite podcast app. To connect with us after the show, you can email us at revolutionsnyc at gmail.com, or you can sign up for our newsletter to get links to what we talk about on the show. Uh, you can do that on our website at revolutionsperminute.simplecast.com. You can also find us on Twitter at NYCRPM. Today we're talking about immigrant justice and ICE out of the courts. Um, and we can do that because we're on this great radio station, WBAI. Um, so if you're listening and you're a regular listener, maybe this is your first time tuning in. You're hearing this program and you say, wow, this is amazing. This connects with me. I wouldn't have heard about this information any other way. Well, become part of the WBAI team. We want people like you as members because it's necessary to have money to have something like this function because we don't take corporate money. We don't take grants because we want to tell the real stories, the truth, not be held back like corporate media is to serve their advertisers. We represent the people. So you can um, call in and pledge at 516 620 3602. That's 516 620 3602. Or you can go on the internet and pledge at give to, that's the number two, WBAI.org. That's give to WBAI.org. Or text us on your phone. Text WBAI to 41444. Um, so um, we're about to jump to a interview that um, I did earlier today with Elijah, another member of NYC DSA Immigrant Justice, and he's going to dive into um, the continuing per, uh, Protect Our Courts legislation as and its relation to the Tiffany Caban uh, Queens uh, District Attorney campaign. 
Hey, so I'm here with Elijah. Elijah, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, just tell us a little bit about why you get, got involved with DSA and immigrant justice in particular. Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. My name is Elijah. I'm a member of uh, New York City Democratic Socialists of America's Immigrant Justice Working Group. And we do a lot of work around the intersection of immigrant rights, both um, as workers' rights, but also around immigration issues specifically. Um, and I got involved with in DSA around the time that many people did in 2016, after um, the Bernie campaign and around the time of Trump's election. And I was sort of unsure of where to find my political home in the organization, but I spoke Spanish and that was a practical skill that I could put to use. And it felt like the immigrant justice working group both was a really salient issue um, that needed addressing and, with, uh, and I could develop my organizing skills out of being able to speak Spanish. And so that's where I started getting involved and have been working in that, in, on those issues since that point. So uh, what is the uh, campaign that Immigrant Justice has been focused on in New York over the past couple of years? And what is the direction that the campaign is going uh, at in the moment? Yeah, so, um, so for the past about a year and a half, we've been working on a campaign um, to end ICE courthouse arrests. ICE has been making arrests um, in across the state of New York, but especially in New York City, um, in courthouses and outside of them. Um, so people going um, both to criminal court, but also civil and family court um, for any number of reasons, um, because they have a hearing, because they are witnesses, um, because for any particular reason, and ICE is um, targeting them in the courts, um, making arrests, um, and this has been has been a huge surge um, under um, the Trump regime. The amount, like the number of ICE arrests since 2016, I think has increased like 2,000. Um, so it's it, just in New York State alone, um, and this has been a huge issue. And for a long time, the courts um, refused to act on this. They 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 had the ability to change policy to require ICE to have judicial warrants um, in order to be able to enter the courts, which would have a, have a huge limiting factor on uh, ICE's ability to make these arrests. Um, and they refused to take action. And so for a, a large part of the campaign, we were working on pressuring the New York chief judge, uh, Janet DeFiori, Recently, we've had a big win in that the Office of Court Administration uh, gave in to public pressure and ruled that ICE can't make these arrests um, in the, in the, inside the courts um, if they don't have judicial warrants. And that's a huge win. We're continuing the campaign because right now there's legislation on the state level um, that was actually introduced last year but has not been, has not been passed yet. Um, called the Protect Our Courts Act. And this legislation um, would uh, formalize that, um, those rules about requiring ICE to have judicial warrants to, enter, uh, to make arrests at the courts and prevent them from being able to make these arrests in the area immediately surrounding um, the courts. So that's super important so that people can actually safely um, go to courts and feel safe when doing so, uh, and not worry about this threat of deportation. Um, so yeah, that's a sort of overview of the campaign. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work to try and pressure um, representatives, both in the state Senate and the assembly to try and um, uh, get them to co-sponsor and pass this legislation before the legislative term is, at, is over in June. So one tactic um, that I've been told that you guys are using in this campaign is um, working alongside the Tiffany Caban campaign for Queens DA. Um, why is uh, Tiffany Caban an important ally for immigrant justice? And why is Queen such an important target for the campaign? 
Yeah, so we've, we've been doing some really great work with the um, DSA's electoral working group in Queens who are um, running a really incredible campaign for Tiffany Caban, who's a, a really progressive candidate for district attorney. Um, there is the, the same DA has been in office for the last 25 years and who's been a very regressive and tough on crime um, DA. And uh, Tiffany Caban is a public defender and she really wants to bring um, radical change to um, the way we view crime and prosecution. Um, and so, uh, and one of the biggest things that she wants to do is decriminalize poverty. And um, we see how in the criminal justice system, um, uh, prosecution and policing are really used to target um, poor people and working class people, people of color. And many times, especially in a place like Queens, which is a really diverse um, the borough of New York with a huge immigrant population that, um, that this kind of, these kind of uh, traditional and tough on crime um, policies, um, both through the legal system and um, through policies uh, and prosecution really um, target um, the immigrant community, uh, which leads them to be being put for or, uh, put forward into the courts. So we want to first of all limit um, the the interactions between immigrants and the criminal justice system. But the other thing that she wants to do is actually prosecute ICE agents for making um, courthouse arrests, uh, and that would be huge. Um, the the ability for um, city or state uh, or local officials to actually um, directly confront ICE, a uh, federal agency who is, which is run really uh, not transparently, really anti-democratically, um, is, is a challenge and is a challenge in a lot of our work on the local level. But Tiffany Caban, in her position as DA, if elected, wants to actually prosecute ICE agents for these arrests. Um, so it's a really great confluence of factors that um, really make it the perfect kind of campaign for us to be working on uh, with this other group in DSA. Um, so we've been canvassing in Queens um, with the campaign and these, these canvases, we, we talk about Tiffany Caban and her platform and why, and especially why that's really important for the immigrant community in New York. And in these conversations, we talk about um, this ICE out of court legislation um, that we are trying to get passed. And so we have two asks for people, which is to get them to vote for um, Tiffany Caban, but also to get them to ask, uh, to ask them to um, call their representatives to pressure them to um, co-sponsor and pass the Protect Our Courts Act. Um, and Queens is really important because, as I said, there's a huge um, immigrant population in Queens, but also because there's some key senator, state senators um, in Queens who we really need to get on board with this legislation. Um, Michael Janaris being one of them, and uh, Joseph Adabo Jr. Um, these two state senators have different, uh, have, you know, lie in different parts of the Democratic Party. Uh, Michael Janaris being more progressive um, than Joseph Adabo Jr., but uh, neither of them have signed on to the Protect Our Courts Act yet. So we, in canvassing, we tell people, please call these representatives, tell them you support this legislation, and tell them that it's their responsibility to also support this legislation. So it seems like you're, you're both building an alliance with a potentially elected um, representative, or in this case, a district attorney, as well as putting pressure on already um, elected politicians. So in your canvassing, uh, what has like the experience been like talking to people? Like what has been their responses to um, hearing about the, the terror that ICE is unleashing across Queens and just generally across the country? Yeah, it's interesting. So a lot of people, while this campaign has been going on for a long time, and uh, there have been more stories about both grassroots pressure 
uh, against it and also what, what is happening in these arrests. Um, not a lot of people realize that ICE is making arrests in the courthouse. Uh, first off, a lot of the time people are just learning about this issue for the first time and people are rightfully uh, shocked, uh, upset and angry to learn that ICE is able to make these arrests in the courts when people are just going there to perform their civic duty. Um, and so we hope to both inform them about this issue and channel that those feelings and those emotions into action. And people are really um, willing to take this step, which um, is a small step uh, and is really easy to do to call their representatives. We give them a script and people are really psyched to get on board with that. And, and more often than not, they want to learn more um, and find out how to get involved in our work. Um, sometimes they're just like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll call. Uh, and, and that's important, too. And, you know, it, people have varying abilities to get involved in political organizing or advocacy. Um, and, but each part of this is really essential to getting uh, ICE out of the courts. So despite, you know, the, the real horrors of this, the deportation apparatus, it's really encouraging to hear both the amazing work that you're involved in, um, in organizing around the issue and the responses that people have, that people are justifiably horrified. So I just want to thank you so much for joining us, Elijah, and sharing um, this information um, with Revolutions Per Minute. And we hope to hear about more successes from the campaign. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I just want to encourage people to wherever you live across New York City or state to call your representatives and encourage them to co-sponsor the Protect Our Courts Act. Um, and if they already are, to get it on the agenda so that we only have a, a few weeks left. Um, you know, the legislative session ends in June. Get them to pass the Protect Our Courts Act and get ICE out of the courts. Thanks so much. Well, thank you again, Elijah, for that amazing interview. Uh, we were so happy to speak with you. And you are listening to Revolutions Per Minute on listener-sponsored WBAI in New York City, broadcasting at 99.5 FM and streaming on your favorite podcast app. Um, we're talking about immigrant justice, and we want to open up the phone lines for the last 10 minutes of the show. You can call in at 212-209-2877. Uh, that is 212-209-2877. Um, but before we start answering your calls, but uh, feel free to call in whenever, uh, I just wanted to ask you, Pam, like, who are the coalition partners that you've been working with um, to really uh, push this fight through? That's a great question because um, I mentioned a few of them, but one of the things that has been so important in this fight is there have been so many different groups across the city. Um, who have been working on this issue across the state as well, but it's, it's really the folks in the city who we have been um, more closely working with. And so um, there are a number of different legal aid attorney organizations um, who have done tremendous work on this issue because they have really been on the front line witnessing what's been happening in the courthouses. And while they're trying to or working to defend their clients, they're also seeing the impact that ICE has had. So legal aid attorneys in, in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, in Queens, in Manhattan, um, have all played a really key role. Um, the Immigrant Defense Project, which I mentioned earlier, has also done a tremendous amount of work bringing this issue to light, um, documenting what's been happening and the increase and the impact, um, and, and played a really key role in getting the, the legislation as far as it is as well. Um, New Sanctuary Coalition, some of the other groups that we've worked with um, have been the New Sanctuary Coalition, the Jackson Heights Immigrant Solidarity Network, um, ICE Out, the International Socialist Organization was very involved in the campaign, DRUM, Bronx Defenders, and LASE, which is now uh, Freedom to Thrive. There have just been so many organizations that have done a tremendous amount of work on this issue, and I think it really has been that organizing from so many different fronts that is really what resulted um, in the, the victory of the OCA decision. And as Elijah said, um, there are a lot of folks working now to try to get the Protect Our Courts Act passed.
Yeah, that seems like a really amazing coalition. And I think it's so critical to recognize that, you know, NYC DSA and our working groups are not in this fight alone. We're here um, working alongside coalition partners. Some of uh, DSA members are members of multiple organizations, and we're all working together uh, in general uh, in many campaigns to, you know, build socialism and fight and a fight for a better world. But specifically here, um, the different sort of work and the uh, different relationships that people can bring to the table is so important um, for winning a campaign, but also kind of building a network of working class institutions that can continue to fight after uh, a campaign has a win or a loss. The battle doesn't just end after one campaign. Um, and so like thinking about things in those terms, um, in the aftermath of the uh, OCA decision, why is it still so necessary to pass the Protect Our Courts Act? Um, well, I think um, one of the, the biggest things, um, and Elijah touched on this as well, is that um, the OCA decision only covers um, arrests within the courthouse and ICE's presence in the courthouse. But so many immigrants, so many people are afraid to come to court at all. Um, what Protect Our Courts Act would do is essentially limit ICE's ability um, and presence to arrest people outside in the immediate area surrounding the courthouse. So Brad Hoyleman, who's the, the sponsor in the state Senate, for instance, has been very vocal um, about the need to, to still pass the legislation, um, which would essentially mean that people would not have that fear of approaching a courthouse, being in the vicinity of a courthouse, um, and would really also codify the, um, the protections within the OCA order. So it's a, yeah, it's a real, I mean, it's great that the now people are protected within the courthouse, but they, they're, the surrounding area is, st is still a danger. Yeah, you have to, I mean, to get inside a building, you, you have to be outside of it first. Yeah. So um, while this uh, win is a, definitely a step in a positive direction, there's obviously so much more fighting that has to go on. And this is a great act, but yet again, just another step in the broader struggle um, for immigrant rights, for the freedom of movement. Uh, capital and empire gets to go wherever in the world it wants, but labor um, is thrown into cages for crossing imaginary lines in the sand that were uh, built out of invasion uh, and warfare in the first place. Uh, so we should always be standing with uh, workers everywhere in the world, regardless of um, uh, where they originally came from and where they are now. Uh, but I just uh, want to remind our listeners that the phone lines are open. You can give us a call at 212-209-2877. Um, and so just in our last a uh, few minutes. What is uh, the best way that people can get involved with the work that uh, DSA's Immigrant Justice Working Group is doing? Well, we have a lot of work, so we are very interested in having new folks get involved. Um, our next meeting is uh, Monday, May 13th, and it's at the CUNY Grad Center, uh, which is 365 Fifth Avenue room 5414. If you're interested in coming, if you're interested in learning more about Immigrant Justice Working Group and how to get involved, you can email us at immigrant.justice at socialists.nyc. That's immigrant.justice at socialists.nyc. Um, you can let us know that you're interested in getting involved. And um, we are also encouraging folks to, um, as Elijah said, call your legislator and encourage him or her uh, to um, vote for the Protect Our Courts legislation. We'll be having a couple calling days if you want to help organize that as well. That sounds amazing. Um, so it looked, uh, we thought we had a caller on the line, but uh, I guess they uh, didn't want to wait. Uh, feel free to call back if you want to come on right now. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, it seems like there are a lot of uh, different ways for people to plug into this work, and there's so many ways that people can be helpful. You can either just do something like calling your representative, or you can get involved on the ground with Immigrant Justice Working Group. And I'm sure there'll be many more projects um, to get involved in that aren't uh, happening right now. And like, like for example, last week, um, our May Day protest that we discussed on the show was uh, that New York City DSA endorsed was highly um, 
built in for it was for immigrant rights uh, and that establishing, uh, you know, standing in solidarity um, on May Day with the workers of the world. And it looks like we have a caller. Hey, you're live on WBAI Revolutions Per Minute. What's your name? What's your question? Lee, my question is, is this a bill in the state Senate? Yes, it is. Okay, the next question, you named a lot of organizations. Is there one website that we can go to to be in contact with the many organizations that are involved? Um, We don't have one coalition website. Um, So I think if you're interested in getting involved, you could reach out to DSA's Immigrant Justice Group um, and... And then we will connect you up with uh, with the coalition work that we're doing. And uh, what okay, was the email you, again? And the can e- you slowly repeat that? Sure. Oh, yeah. So you Let can me hang up. So I can get a pen and write it down. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Thanks. You can email immigrant dot justice at socialists dot nyc, and we'll get you connected up with the work. Yeah, and it's it's just really incredible work. Um, I'm I'm not allowed to tell anyone to do anything here, but I definitely encourage people to stand in solidarity with immigrants um, and do whatever you can um, to support uh, the most vulnerable people in our society that do so much of the critical work. Uh, so much of the food that you eat is um, like worked is that immigrants uh like suffer daily to produce at for horrific wages um and those low wages are a byproduct of the divide and conquer strategy of the capitalist ruling class they uh don't want um immigrants to be able to build power but as we've heard all day immigrants and their allies and coalition partners are coming together to fight back against the deportation apparatus and they don't want you to hear stories and when i say they i'm referring again to um you know the capitalist class the corporate media they don't want you to hear stories like this um because then it really starts to question the entire system that empowers them. So if you want to keep hearing content like Revolutions Per Minute, uh, please uh, you know, become part of the WBI family. Uh, you can do that uh, by calling in at 516-620-3602. That's 516-620-3602. Or you can uh, give, go to give to WBAI.org. That's give, the number two. WBAI.org or text WBAI to 41444. Um, you know, please become part of the WBAI team if you want to hear more socialist content like Revolutions Per Minute. You've been listening to us on uh, listener sponsored WBAI radio in New York City, broadcasting on 99.5 FM and streaming on your favorite podcast app. To connect with us after the show, you can email us at revolutionsnyc at gmail or sign up for our newsletter um, to get links to what we talk about on the show. You can do that on our website, revolutionsperminute.simplecast.com. And you can also find us on Twitter at NYCRPM. Today, we've been talking about immigrant justice and the ICE out of the courts campaign with Pam and our pre-recorded interview with Elijah. I would like to thank both of you. Uh, Thank you. uh, Thank you so much for coming on. Um, And thank you, Elijah. I know you can't respond right now. Um, And so, yeah, you've been listening to us uh, and we'll be back next week. Revolutions Per Minute is a weekly radio show from the New York City chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America, recorded live at WBAI 99.5 in Brooklyn every Tuesday at 5. RPM is about doing the work, the work to build a democratic socialist future. Every week, hear the latest news, analysis, and organizing experience from the minds and hearts of activists fighting every day in NYC. Join the movement at socialists.nyc.